Do you have friends that only ever choose combat spells? The friends that never look past the amount of dice that you roll for the spell? Or maybe you are that friend. Well, consider this an intervention. So sit down and enjoy the video because I'm about to give you five overpowered spells that don't start with fireball and end with ball. Wait, I, I did that one wrong. <laughs> But before we start our Spellcasters Anonymous meeting, you should know that I have made other videos like this in the past that I've linked in the description box below for you to check out after the video. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump on into it. Starting off, we have the second level spell, Silence. This spell creates a 20-foot radius sphere of silence within a 120-foot range of the caster. Any creature in the sphere is deafened and immune to thunder damage. Now, the deafened condition isn't really anything to write home about, and thunder damage isn't exactly super prevalent. No, the power actually comes from the second part of the spell. The part of the spell that states, casting a spell within the sphere that requires a verbal component is impossible. Since there's no sound, the caster can't speak the verbal component, meaning no spell. But that doesn't sound too bad, right? I mean, how many spells require you to be able to speak? Well, turns out a shit ton. Out of 554 spells on D&D Beyond, only 32 of them do not require verbal components. Which means only 6% of spells are able to be cast while you're in the sphere. Considering this spell lasts 10 minutes, it's unlikely any caster would survive an encounter after being silenced. Now I have to say that they need to stay in the radius of the sphere in order to remain silenced, but there are plenty of other spells that can help with that. Which is actually a perfect segue into our next spell, or, or spells. And those spells are the second level hold person and its slightly older cousin, the fifth level spell hold monster. These two spells are effectively the same spell. They are just usable on different targets, which is why I bundled them together for this. When you cast these spells, the target needs to make a wisdom saving throw or be paralyzed. Once paralyzed, the target can remake the saving throw at the end of its next turns, or it remains paralyzed until it makes the save. Now, if you find yourself paralyzed, you're in for a world of hurt. Aside from the obvious, you know, not being able to literally move or do anything, being paralyzed is arguably the worst condition in all of 5th edition. The creature auto fails all strength saves and deck saves, and any attack against them has advantage. But the worst part of being paralyzed, the reason these spells are broken, is because any attack that hits a paralyzed creature within 5 feet of them is an automatic critical strike. So imagine this, you cast Hold Person, paralyzing your enemy. Who's up next in initiative? Oh, would you look at that? It just so happens to be your Barbarian Paladin Multiclass, who rages, has multi-attack, has brutal critical, and just so happens to have a magical great axe with the ability to smite. Needless to say, the poor bastard's likely dead, and won't even get the chance to piss themselves as the Barbarian runs up yelling incomprehensible gibberish. Next, we have the second level spell, Detect Thoughts. This spell allows you to detect thoughts. Who would have guessed? When you first cast this spell, you can read surface thoughts of any creature within range. It's important to explain that reading surface thoughts does not require a saving throw. So you can use this spell to get an idea of where someone's mind is at any given point in time. A handy little tidbit that not many people know about this is you can actually use this spell to detect enemies you can't see. It detects other thinking creatures within 30 feet through walls, so you can get an idea of how many creatures are around you. However, the largest part of the spell is probing deeper into somebody's mind. You can use an action to get additional information. This action does require a wisdom saving throw and the creature knows that you're attempting to probe their mind regardless of whether or not they make the save. But if it succeeds, you get information on the reasoning, their emotional state, or something that looms large in their mind. Now, since the creature knows you're attempting to read its mind, this spell is much better used in interrogation scenarios, which honestly is great for how this spell functions, as if you use it in tandem with other continuous questions, you'll likely get information that you wouldn't otherwise get. Think about this. You just ate the last donut. The donut that was supposed to be for your girlfriend. Your girlfriend notices the missing donut and asks you if you ate it. Any individual who doesn't want to die a very painful death will clearly say, no girlfriend, I did not eat the last donut. But you know damn well you're going to be thinking about that donut. It's sugary glaze, it's chocolate frosted top with sprinkles, oh it was amazing and oh now you're dead because your girlfriend read your mind and now you're featured on an episode of Snapped Killer Couples. That's kind of how the spell works. <laughs> 
ask questions about things you want to know. The creature is then thinking about it, and even if they don't tell you, you can read their mind, and you find out that that son of a bitch ate your donut. And then you can end him. <laughs> that is a very odd tangent, but let's move on to our next spell. Next up, we have a spell that you'll likely recognize as one of the most popular spells in all of 5th edition, and that is the 4th level spell, Polymorph. This spell transforms a targeted creature into a new form. Simple as that. Generally, this is used as a way to end combat quickly by polymorphing an enemy into a sheep or something like that. An unwilling creature needs to make a wisdom saving throw or they're turned into whatever the caster decides. The killer is that if the target fails their save, they're stuck like that for either an hour or until their new form drops to zero hit points. But if you do drop the polymorph target to zero hit points, they don't die. Instead, they revert back to their original state with whatever hit points they had left and any excess damage you dealt to that polymorph form also carries over to the standard form of that creature. It works very similar to a druid's wild shape ability. Now, some would see this as a detriment to the overall power of the spell. However, I see that as an obstacle that we must overcome. For example, polymorph someone into a bunny, pick up said bunny, throw said bunny off a cliff, instant 20d6 damage, easy peasy like that or fireball, or honestly, whatever, a big spell where a target is suppressed by polymorph is an easy way to get up a good chunk of damage. But polymorph also has another line in there that makes it much stronger than simple crowd control. The new form can be any beast whose challenge rating is equal to or less than the target's challenge rating or level, whichever one they have. So you could technically polymorph a party member and transform them into a beast. Now, you might be asking, but why would I do that? Why not just have a druid since they can already do that? Well, you're correct. Except you're kind of not at the same time. Technically, yes, Polymorph is similar power level to a moon druid's wild shape. So, why does it matter? Well, I'll tell you why it matters. This right here, you see this bad Larry? Yeah, that's a Tyrannosaurus Rex and it's gonna fuck your shit up, yo. You can Polymorph your buddy into a T-Rex and wreak havoc among your enemies. Aside from the obvious power play fear factor here, the T-Rex gets two attacks. Its bite specifically deals 4d12 plus 7 damage and restrains enemies. That is bananas damage. And alongside a giant health pool of 136, this can be used to soak up just as much damage as it can dish out. So if you weren't going to take Polymorph already, take Polymorph. And finally, the last spell we have for today is going to be the 5th level spell, Bigby's Hand. If you have watched any of my videos in the past, you already know what I'm about to say. The ability to weaponize your bonus action is one of the most effective ways to increase your combat effectiveness. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Bigby's hand creates a giant spectral hand that can do anything that I guess a giant hand could do. The hand is an object with 20 AC, HP equal to that of the caster, and a strength of 26. This matters and you'll see why in a minute. You can cast this spell as an action, and on your subsequent turns thereafter, you can use your bonus action to move the hand and have it cause one of four different effects. The effects are Clenched Hand, Forceful Hand, Grasping Hand, or Interposing Hand. Clenched Fist is exactly what you might think. You punch the son of a bitch with your giant magic fist, dealing 48 damage. Forceful Hand allows you to push a creature. Interposing Hand lets you get in the way of attackers, essentially providing cover, and Grasping Hand, which is the main focus I want to speak about today, is the most effective way to use it. If you watched last week's video, this may sound familiar, and if you haven't, then you're clearly not subscribed, and that's a problem, so you should probably go fix that. Grasping Hand attempts to grapple a creature, and when making grapple checks, you use the hand strength. Remember what I said earlier, the thing about the hand having a strength of 26? That means that it has a plus 8 to all grapple checks. Alongside the incredible bonus, if the target is medium or smaller, then it has advantage on all contested grapple checks, making it near impossible to break out of a grapple. And since breaking out of a grapple requires an action, a creature will need to beat the hand's check, which is likely has advantage on, and even if it does get out, the hand can just grapple again on its next turn. But that's not even all of it. Since it's unlikely the creature will be able to break out of the grapple anyways, if the creature is still grappled by the hand, you can use your bonus action to crush the target, dealing an extra d6 damage plus your spell costing ability modifier. Pretty useful if you ask me. In terms of versatility, the hand provides damage, utility, and defensive capabilities, all for the cost of a 5th level concentration spell. So, if you always wanted a third hand to do... 
I don't know, to hold stuff, then you probably should be on the lookout for Bigby's hand whenever you get the chance. And that concludes today's video. If you're interested in other overpowered spells, I have made other videos like that that I've linked in the description box below for you to check out. Also, if you think I missed any overpowered spells, let me know in the comment section below. I read every comment, reply to almost all of them, and who knows, I might even feature it in the next video. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you on Friday.